Onside. Onside. The first run, it was a little bit kind of bewildering, <laughs> bewildering, I guess, where I kind of got to the bottom and went, I have no idea what just happened, but it was fun. Let's go again. And then from there, it was a case of, okay, how do we go faster? Uh, 2018 was unreal. It was my, my first Olympics and to, to go and put that jacket on for the first time was an absolute dream come true. But this time around, I feel like it's about achieving my potential and just seeing just what I can do on a sled. It's not hard to transpose across into bobsleigh. As, uh, most of the other Winter Olympic disciplines, you wouldn't have a chance in hell. But uh, for bobsleigh, then it, it's relatively, relatively easy for a track and field athlete to do it. The more we can include people with disabilities in every single area of our life, I think the better off that our society will be and the better off those people with disabilities will be. Welcome to Onside the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Our mission is to protect the integrity of sport and the health and welfare of those who participate in Australian sport. Hello and welcome to Sport Integrity Australia's Clean and Gold podcast in the lead up to the Winter Olympics and Paralympics in Beijing. Well, 44 athletes have been selected to compete at the Winter Olympics in China. On this episode of Clean and Gold, we'll be joined by Winter Olympian Jackie Narricott, her uncle Paul, who competed in both the Summer and Winter Olympic Games, and six-time Winter Paralympic gold medalist Michael Milton. All that coming up in just a moment. Well, Jackie Narricott is competing in her second Winter Olympics. Jackie is competing in the skeleton. She switched from track and field in 2012, and Jackie heads into the Winter Olympics as one of the favourites for gold after becoming the first Australian to win the skeleton at a World Cup in St Moritz. Jackie joins us now on the Clean and Gold podcast. And Jackie, you must be brimming with confidence after winning in St Moritz, heading into the uh, the Winter Olympic Games. Oh, yeah, it's uh, coming, up, coming off St Moritz is fantastic. To actually have that concrete performance in front of me, like, I've always known I could do it. Now I've got that concrete evidence to go, yeah, okay, I'm not crazy. We can actually do this, which is nice. Because your previous best had been about seventh, yet you broke the track record. What was the difference, do you think? Um, I think it was just a case of everything came together, right time, right place. I was in a super relaxed and happy headspace leading into that, that week, actually that, that entire week. So it was just fun. It was perfect St. Moritz. And it was just one of those weeks where everything worked can you tell us about Skeleton? Because uh, you took it up in 2012. You competed in your first World Cup in 2014 after being a, a track and field athlete uh, running in the 100, 200, triple jump and long jump. You, you made the conversion to Skeleton. Can you tell us about it and what it was like when you first took it up? Okay, so for those who don't know, Skeleton is basically um, a sport where you take an iced water slide and a heavy boogie board take a running start and dive down that thing head first without any breaks at about 140 K an hour um, all around North America and Europe. When I first tried it, I was in the US in upstate New York and they threw us down from halfway on the track with the instructions of lie there, don't move. And it was just so much fun, fun from the beginning. The first run, it was a little bit kind of bewildering, <laughs> bewildering, I guess, where I kind of got to the bottom and went, I have no idea what just happened, but it was fun. Let's go again. And then from there, it was a case of, okay, how do we go faster? So the aim, I guess, is to get as much speed as possible before you hit the track. And and because you have been a track and field athlete, you're able to get that leg speed. Is, is that, the I guess, the theory behind it? Yeah, pretty much. So any um, athlete from a, from a power background, so whether that's track and field, whether that's rugby, um, gymnastics is, is an, another good one as well, then you can transfer that that power particularly into a good start and get you off and running. So how do you train for it, uh, given it happens so quickly? Um, we do a lot of lifting, so the power, clean, squats, deadlifts in the gym, and then lots of sprinting on the track too. And if you're fortunate enough to live in a country where it has a push track, so then, then you can actually practice the, the first 50 metres either on a tartan push track or on an ice one, ideally. 
It's over pretty quickly, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> the start's about five and a half seconds, but the, the whole run can be anywhere between 52 seconds, I think is the quickest, up to kind of 109. So your position as you hit the track, I guess that that's very important, isn't it, to, to get the most speed as possible once you get going. Yeah, so the um, the the start has a has a crest in it, and the idea is to um, get, actually get, push yourself to to run downhill. There's a sweet spot where those last couple of steps are really fast and powerful, and give you that nice big velocity push going down down the track. Or if you run a couple of steps too far, you actually start breaking, and then you slow yourself down. Is there a certain amount of danger involved? I mean. We are going head first at 140k an hour, so yeah, there is. But in terms of uh, comparison to a few of the other Winter Olympic sports, I think we're doing all right. Okay. Can you tell us about, uh, I guess, your desire to compete for Australia? Because you've already competed for Australia at, at one Winter Olympic so far. Does it feel different this time around? It does. I feel like I'm in a much better position to perform this time around. Uh, 2018 was unreal. It was my, my first Olympics and... To, to go and put that jacket on for the first time was an absolute dream come true. But this time around, I feel like it's about achieving my potential and just seeing just what I can do on a sled. Now, as I mentioned at the start, you created history by becoming the first Australian to win a World Cup in Skeleton. You did that in, in St. Moritz. You've been training in Bath. So your preparation has been ideal in the lead up to the Winter Olympics. This season it has, yeah. Um, it's been a fairly normal <laughs> World Cup season for us, which has been been a, a nice change after last season, which definitely wasn't for me at least. Um, yeah, it's a it's all coming together at the right time. Well, tell us, has it always been a dream to compete at the Olympic Games? Because I, I did read that you had hoped to compete at the Summer Olympics. Uh, that didn't turn out, but now the Winter Olympics, heading off to your second one. Was it always your desire to, to compete at the Olympics and suddenly it changed? Oh, yeah. From the second, I think I was 10, when the Sydney Olympics happened, that was what really lit that fire inside me that, that was like, okay, I'm going to be an Olympian. I'm going to be an athlete. I don't care how I get there. Initially, I definitely wanted to be a sprinter and have my heart set on going to the Summer Olympics with um, having, well, trying to go in the footsteps of Uncle Paul. Yep. And then... I kind of realized about 16 that I wasn't fast enough, I wasn't jumping far enough, that that wasn't really going to happen. So then it was a case of, okay, what other sports can I try? <laughs> and how else can I make this dream come true? You mentioned there, Paul, of course, Paul Narricott competed at both the Winter and Summer Olympics, an incredible sprinter, broke 10 seconds at one stage in his career, beat uh, Carl Lewis, 1984. So what a pedigree, and then competed at the Winter Olympic Games in Albertville. Do, do you sort of, I guess, look up to him? Has he been a, an inspiration to you to say, well, listen, I can do what Uncle Paul did? Oh, definitely. I've always wanted to follow in, in his footsteps and emulate what he did. Hopefully go one better and actually get a medal, but that is going to be an incredibly difficult task. So to, to get to, to, to Olympics and also create history like he did is pretty cool. Given that everybody seems to compete all over the world at different events. Is there a sense of camaraderie within the team? Yeah, I think so. That's one thing that I love about our uh, Winter Olympic team because it is a little bit on the smaller side, especially compared to our summer team. Then once we get there, everyone just gets behind each other. And in Pyeongchang, it was such an awesome uh, place to be. Everyone from the second you, you got to that village was behind you. And it's so nice. And thankfully, that seems to have... Um, continued after 2018 and even now we're constantly messaging each other going like yes awesome <laughs> result that's unreal yep so it's it, it's nice to know that no matter where you are in the world people from home are watching and of course you've got the specter of covid heading over these winter olympic games does that make you nervous to a certain degree yes but it, that's more because the ramifications of catching covid now mean that it, it's all over and we've come so far, we are so close. For it all to go wrong now from something silly is like that, that's heartbreaking to, to think that that could possibly happen. So you've had to take special precautions, I would imagine, to, to make sure that you don't catch COVID uh, and that would effectively rule you out of the 
Winter Olympic team. So you, you've taken special precautions? Yeah, so the entire World Cup season, um, we were being tested twice a week, sometimes three times a week, depending on how many COVID cases there were in, on the World Cup circuit. And then after St. Moritz, we drove home to the UK. And since then, we've just been trying to avoid absolutely everybody <laughs> because COVID is kind of rampant over here right now. Um, and it's just a case of getting food delivered, making sure we're not touching anything, not seeing anyone until we get to China. Well, good luck, Jackie. We're right behind you and just can't wait to watch you in the skeleton. It's going to be fantastic. And thanks very much for joining us on Onside. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Jackie. You're listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Well, joining us now on the Clean and Gold podcast is Paul Narricott, Jackie's uncle. Paul became the first Australian to compete at both the Summer and Winter Olympics. He was a sprinter at the 1984 LA Summer Olympic Games, then a member of the bobsleigh team at the 1992 Albertville Winter Olympic Games. And Paul, we've just heard from Jackie. She says you inspired her. Uh, She's now going to her second Winter Olympics. It must give you a a sense of satisfaction to see her doing so well. Oh, um, immensely. We're immensely proud of what Jackie's doing and thrilled, so thrilled for her that things are are coming together for her. So uh, it's nice of her to say that I was her inspiration, but if I I manage to just open her eyes to the fact that there are sporting opportunities other than the mainstream sports that you see all the time. I mean, at the moment, we've got the Australian Open on, the the tennis players, and there's the the women's uh, test match happening here in Monica. So they're the main, you know, mainstream Australian sports, but but uh, there's a lot of other ones out there. And if you aspire to maybe being an elite level sportsman and your skill sets maybe not quite fit into those uh, mainstream sports, there's lots of others out there for you to try, particularly, uh, you know, the winter sports. Well, how did you get started in, in bobsleigh? Oh, by, by pure chance. I was just trying to, uh, to keep fit. Uh, I was at the AIS and the bobsleigh team was um, uh, coming into the AIS for a training camp. These people were in the gym and, um, you know, just a, a casual chat. And I thought, well, gee whiz, you live once. Um, I'd always watch these sports on television, as probably most Australians do, thinking that you're never, ever going to get a chance to do them. Um, so... You, you either take opportunities or you don't. <laughs> and, uh, I thought I'd have a crack, and it was. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't easy. It wasn't always. Uh, most of the time, it was uh, the competing part of it's fantastic. Uh, there's always lots of politics in these sports, but uh, you just got to put up with that. Those uh, those rough bits and and in, enjoy the enjoy the sport. It must have been strange though, landlocked um, in Canberra. Suddenly talking about the Winter Olympics in bobsleigh. How do you prepare for something like that? Well, for the event that I was in, the discipline of bobsleigh, uh, I was just a brakeman. So it's not it's not difficult at all, all right? So really, um, your training is essentially what you'd be doing as a track and field athlete, a track and field sprinter or a jumper. So it was nothing, nothing out of the box for me to do. The actual skill set that you need to do is pretty easy. Um, the guys who should get all the... All the credits are the are the are the people who uh, drive the drive the sleds. Um, there's 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 real talent in that. But to be a brakeman in a bobsled team, all you really got to do is you know, you got to be a really good athlete. That's all. So you know, it's not it's not hard to transpose across into bobsled. As, uh, most of the other Winter Olympic disciplines, you wouldn't have a chance in hell. You know, you go <laughs> you. You want to be a figure skater? Well, you're you're starting on the ice as soon as you can walk, basically. And for lots of the other things, you know, cross country skiing and all, yeah, you you, you couldn't do it. But uh, for bobsleigh, then it, it's relatively relatively easy for a track and field athlete to do it. Yes, talking to Jackie, of course, she's in the skeleton, and it's an incredible thrill. She said it's just a, a an amazing experience to go down head first at, at such a speed. Uh well. I would say to anyone, if you ever get a chance uh, to take a, what they call a tourist ride down in a, on a, in a bobsleigh or, or probably not going to go down as a tourist on a, on a luge or a skeleton run, but if you ever do, 
you want to have a go because it's 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 magnificent fun. Um, I mean, Jackie makes it look easy because she's really really good at it. But when she first started, she'd be ping ponging off the, you know, the uh, the edges, the off the walls. Um, but that's <laughs> that's what you do. Um, but it is the the, um, the the speed element of it all and the, the the thrill that you get. I guess it must probably like. You know, people who surf a lot, that that um, the, the the adrenaline rush they get off is they they come off a wave. You know, they feel the force of that wave throwing them down the down the face of it. Uh, I imagine it's it's analogous uh, to that. Is it, I guess with Jackie, have you taken a, a close interest in in her career as a as a winter Olympian? Have I? Yes. Oh, yeah, we do. Um, you anyway, know, it's tremendous now with technology. You can we can watch them on uh, the races on YouTube, uh, and try to try to watch every uh, all the races. Some of them are pretty late, but uh, generally I can watch the replays. So you know, and over a long over a long period of time, I think she's been at it. This is certainly her second Olympics, um, and she was on the tour before then. So you know, it's a ten year journey, and really, uh, it's it's only it's only really the last. Uh, the last three, three or four years, where um, she's she's really, really come together. But particularly the last year, she's you know she's going exceptionally well now. So uh, I think she's a I think she's a real chance. She's not a favourite, but uh, she's she's a realistic chance. Has she sought much advice from you over the years? Well, um, in, in terms of the technical elements of skeleton, I wouldn't be much help uh, much help to her there. No, I understand the sport, uh, but. In terms of just scheduling and all that sorts of stuff, you know, I've had chats to to her family about it all. Uh, lots of the places that she goes to now weren't on the the uh, the, the sliding uh, schedule when I was there. They're, they're all new tracks, um, so I haven't had, from a technical perspective, much to do with Jacqueline, Jacqueline's uh, sliding at all because you simply can't. Um, uh, I can't help her there, but uh, the International Bobsleigh uh, and Skeleton Federation, they're wonderful support for the developing nations. They have coaches appointed to them. I mean, it's not as good as having your own personal coach, but you have to start somewhere. Uh, and that's, you know, so so she had a, like, if you like, a group coach uh, early on, and then she's progressed now. Her, her husband, uh, Dom, he was the bronze medalist for Britain from uh, – uh, Pyeongchang. So she she goes to um, to Beijing with probably the best personal coach you could possibly have. So um, yeah, it's 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 all coming together for her. And just as a final question, uh, as Jackie competes at the Winter Olympics in Beijing did, and prepares to do so, did, does it bring back some great memories for you? Do you do you rekindle some of the stuff that you did? Uh, when you competed at 1992? Uh, so, yeah, oh, yeah. sure, lots of it. I mean, where she won her World Cup uh, in St. Moritz, it's probably, it's where I had my very first uh, uh, experience of bobsleigh. Um, I've, uh, it's, the, it's the one and only place I've ever been able to see Jackie slide alive. Uh, my wife and I got there a couple of years ago to, to, to see her slide. So uh, for for her personally, for us as a family, uh, it, it, it couldn't have happened at a better place. And yeah, I have you know wonderful, wonderful memories of some of the places that I went to and the, and the sporting events. It, it was it was uh, an interesting chapter of my sporting career, one I didn't think I'd ever have, but I'm really grateful uh, that it came along and um, <laughs> I, I, I hope Jackie uh, can walk away. Uh, thrilled with her uh, her lifetime experience in sport. Yes, he's do- doing very well. And as you mentioned there, the St. Moritz World Cup win just a couple of weeks ago in the lead up to the Beijing Winter Olympic Games. Paul, thanks very much for joining us on Onside today. It's great. Uh, it's a pleasure, Tim. Bye. Well, Michael Milton won six gold, three silver and two bronze medals at the Winter Paralympics through five Winter Paralympic Games. He's Australia's most successful Winter Paralympian Well, Michael, what makes the Paralympics so special for you? You've been to both winter and summer Paralympics. What makes the winter Paralympics so special? I think, you know, number one for me, snow, ice, it's magical stuff in terms of, uh, yeah, how much fun you can have on it. 
the how high you can jump, how fast you can go. Um, so you know, for me, everything around winter sports is is based on snow and ice, and it's uh, you know fantastic fun to to do as an athlete, but it's also fantastic to watch, and and particularly for Australians, we don't get to see that much winter sport. And uh, you know, for me, when I get the opportunity to obviously uh, still knowing a few people involved, um, it's it's amazing to watch. What are your expectations in the lead up to the Winter Paralympics? I think from a Paralympic point of view, you know, I think we've got a, uh, a relatively young team. We've got a really strong snowboard athlete, Ben, um, who has been on the podium twice at World Championships in Norway last week. And so we'll be looking forward to some good performances from Ben. And, uh, you know, I think we'll see some some new um, skiing athletes. One of our sit skier, Josh, um, went to his first big international competitions um, this season and is skiing really well. Probably not ready to be at medal level or anything yet but uh is showing some fantastic early talent so i think we'll see some some good athletes but uh perhaps uh on the skiing side um not that many athletes who have been on the podium yet this winter has COVID impacted the preparations do you think oh absolutely you know i think it impacts on every area of life and when it comes to international travel um you know there were some athletes who certainly have sat out um not this year, but last year, um, the, the amount of travel that's possible, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, COVID has an impact on all, all areas of life. You alluded to it just a moment ago. There is a sense of the unknown for a lot of Australians when it comes to winter sports, whether it be the Winter Olympics or Winter Paralympics. Uh, we see something new a lot of the times so that we were not exposed to a, a lot beforehand. You know, it's it's just it's just different, and uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, for our northern hemisphere um, people, you see so much winter sport on TV, whether it be uh, you know a whole range of different winter sports. But for me, um, seeing athletes doing amazing things is always fantastic. But to to be exposed to a wider range of sports, uh, I think, is is a really good thing and and uh, engages many people. And you know the number of people I see who talk about loving watching the Winter Olympics, and we'll see some improving um, tele- television coverage in terms of the Winter Paralympic Games this year from Beijing. Well, we've seen uh, the impact that Dylan Alcott's announcement as Australian of the Year has made on on people with a disability. How important is it for people with a disability to see? something like the the Winter Paralympics? You know, from my point of view, the more people with disabilities that we see in every different area of our lives, whether it be social, whether it be work, whether it be on television as elite athletes, um, you know, the more we can include people with disabilities in every single area of our life, I think the better off that our society will be and the better off those people with disabilities will be and that the more normalised people with disabilities will, will exposure will be. And, and to me, that's a very, very good thing. What about you? Do you get excited when you see it and think, well, I could probably still do some of those things? <laughs> um, you know, I'm, uh, as most uh, retired athletes, I'd like to dream that, that I could still do it or that I'd still have what it takes. But uh, in reality, I'm way too old and fat and slow. So uh, that's just a fact of life. Uh, just logistically, because you've been there as an assistant coach at, at the Winter Paralympics in the past, as well as being a competitor, logistically, it must be hard at times given you're dealing with so many variables when it comes to winter sports. You know, I think uh, we'll see, certainly from a Paralympic point of view, you know, we'll see all of those COVID protocols and impacts and, and stuff tested at the Olympics. And so by the time the Paralympics comes around, I think we will certainly be in a better position to know about some of those challenges. Um, the... I guess other impacts of COVID, you know, for most of the athletes, the test events all got cancelled. So there'll certainly be some uncertainties there going to Beijing for a first time. Uh, you know, they've, I'm sure they've seen video of, of the hill, but there's still variables there and, and not understanding local conditions like you might have if you've been there for a, at a test event. So there's certainly going to be a lot of uncertainty there. But, uh, you know, if COVID's taught us anything, it's to be able to adapt to all of these sort of things. 
things, and I'm sure the Australian team will adapt as well or better than uh, than at some of their international competitors. Yes, a sense of a, the unknown for all of us, I think. But uh, Michael, thanks very much for joining us. Really looking forward to both the Winter Olympics and also the Winter Paralympics coming up very shortly in China. Thanks very much for joining Sport Integrity Australia's Clean and Gold podcast today. Thanks, Tim. Well, thanks for listening to Sport Integrity Australia's Clean and Gold podcast series. We'll have more in the lead up to the Winter Paralympics in Beijing. You've been listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Send in your podcast questions or suggestions to media at sportintegrity.gov.au. For more information on Sport Integrity Australia, please visit our website, www.sportintegrity.gov.au, or check out our Clean Sport app.